G'day YouTube, it's Turbo Tristan here, and today we're going back to our roots, which is how-to videos, and we're gonna do a how-to swap over all of the sensors on a K24 or a K20 engine. We have all of the sensors just here. We're gonna go over those in just a moment. We're gonna be getting back into some science and some how-to stuff. I'm gonna be picking up a D-series engine and another K-series engine soon. We can get them on stands, get them all cleaned up, and I'm gonna teach you guys how to do all sorts of different things on K and D-series engines. If you have any questions, chuck them in the comments below and we'll make videos on it. So back to the how-to stuff, back to the Honda DIY stuff. Alrighty, everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining us again. If you haven't, make sure you subscribe. Heaps of content coming on how-to stuff with Hondas. Why am I doing this? Well, the first reason is this engine is an unknown engine. I got it from a bloke on Facebook Marketplace. He told me the car had about 180,000 Ks on it. Do I believe him? I'd like to, but probably not really. The other reason is when we were setting up the Haltech and getting the car running and putting the street tune in it, there was a couple of small issues where it wasn't reading the cam angle properly. So that was flicking on and off. You'd have to turn the car on and off, wait a minute, kick it back on again, clear that code, clear it off the Haltech and off you go. It doesn't always happen for the most part, it's pretty good. But that's just one of those things that I don't wanna deal with, so I'm gonna replace all of the sensors. So the very first one that we're gonna change out is the variable camshaft actuator. That's this guy here, this is what it looks like. And when there's a signal given to this sensor, it pushes, I think, oil pressure and stuff like that into the variable cam actuator. To be honest, I don't really know how it works, but we're gonna say that and uh, that just helps you adjust the VCT gear up to, in my case, up to 50 degrees, 25 degrees advanced, 25 degrees retard. So most of these have a 25 degree cam gear. Uh, you can swap it out to a 40 or a 50. I went all the way with a 50. So that's this one. The next one we're gonna do is the Hall effect sensor, which is your crank trigger wheel sensor. This one lives underneath here at the bottom of the engine, down there near the balancer. I'll show you that once it's up in the air. Then we have these two guys here, cam angle sensors. You've got an intake and an exhaust sensor. Now, because of how I've set this all up, this is gonna be slightly tricky, but I'm sure we can manage. It's just 10 mil here, 10 mil there, wiggle them out pop them out and then plug them back in. Very, very important to note, put them in the right way and use the right plugs. When I first started up the engine and we had Logan over here, my fault, I plugged in all the clips and I put them around the wrong way and it sounded really, really angry like it was cammed, um, but obviously it wasn't. I swapped them over and now it runs smooth as butter. The tools you're gonna need for this job is a 10 mil ratchet, the infamous 10 mil and a 10 mil spanner. This one's got a ratchet on the end of it, but depending on the space, I might just need to use a regular 10 mil spanner. We're gonna to get to this one first. What you're gonna to need to do is undo this plug and then there is a 10 mil just here. Undo that, give it a bit of a wiggle, pop it straight out. Now, if you're trying to do this on an Accord or an Integra, or a Civic that already has a K-Series in there, that's gonna be quite tight to get to. I did do it on Ronda last weekend, and I kind of glossed over that, which is why I'm making this video, because I'm doing the exact same thing, but I wanna take a bit more time and show you guys how to do it. It's really, really simple. All of these parts have been listed on the Spool Up website. As soon as that's up and running, you'll be able to go and buy those there. They work, they're perfect. They're top quality brands. We've got Delphi and we've got FAE, and we've got Intermotor. Uh, so they're all OE replacement parts, which you can get from spoolup.com. So we're gonna fit that now, put the camera down. I do need two hands. I'm gonna glove up as well, so I don't get greasy fingers. And uh, I'll show you when I pull the old one out. All right, so we got that guy out of there. Here it is over on the makeshift workbench. And let me tell you, when I pulled this out the first time, 
Uh, it was extremely dirty and grubby. I've given it a clean out with some brake cleaner before I put it back in my engine. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely time for a replacement and it can't hurt to stick this guy in. So just a matter of coming around here, just greasing up that little Viton O-ring just with the bit of oil that's on my finger and slot that guy straight back in there. Now it does have this pretty funny looking bolt, but I'm glad they did this because it means you can actually access it. You don't have to go all the way deep down to this level. You can get it from right at the end of the case. So stick that back in onto the next one. All right, so that's installed. Just remember, use a quarter inch drive. That way you can't get too much torque on it and snap the nut and bolt off in the head. So just get it to its snug and then give it a little squeeze like that. And then that's all you need to do for that one. One thing to mention, which I'm sure there's gonna be at least one person in the comments that would have picked me up on this if I didn't mention it, but there is a little cover just down here. It's in front of the power steering pump. It's a little two bolt thing and there is a gasket and a little gauze in there. To do this job 100% properly, you'll need to pull that off and clean it out, replace the gasket and off you go. I'm not doing that for the simple fact is I'm gonna have to remove the idler pulley, the engine mount and the power steering pump to do that. Not gonna do it. So fight me in the comments. I know I should. I'm not. All right, next up, I'm gonna do the intake and exhaust cam sensors. Now, again, they're just a 10 millimeter bolt just down there and just there. Probably shouldn't be too hard to get to, but what I'm going to do and the way that I recommend you should do it is do them one at a time because they are different. They do look different and the plugs are different. So one at a time, that way you can't confuse them, you can't cross them over and you can't put them on backwards. All right, that wasn't so hard. There's the hole there. This is the sensor, so I've done the exhaust side first. And this is the new one that goes in. Both of these, that one says on there, made in Japan. This one, made in Japan. And uh, we're gonna stick that in. So benefits are nice new O-ring seal, plus a new sensor that hasn't gotten hot a million times and it's due to fail. I don't know which one of these it was. I think it was actually both of them play up. Uh, on the old engine, so swapping them over with new ones should eliminate that problem. Just for consistency, here is the intake cam sensor. And yes, it is exactly the same as the other one in every single way. So we're gonna bang that in. What I've been doing is I've been using some of this um, oil from the sensor that I pulled out first and just putting that around the O-ring just like that, a bit hard with one hand. That way it slides in and I don't pinch the O-ring and it's just gonna seal a lot nicer as well. And uh, just a tip for all you kids playing along, if you're running one of these ridiculous things, uh, which you do need, but it's a pretty dumb design, uh, you'll have to take the bolt out and then swivel it, unplug it, and then pull it out. Doesn't really work because of that thing being in the road. You can't just pull it straight out nice and easily. But the last guy is this crank trigger sensor. So we're gonna stick that in. This is what it looks like. And this is where it lives over here. This one's a pretty easy one to get to on a Civic or a CL9 uh, and especially easy on a K-swap car. So it's just that 10 mil bolt, undo that plug, pull it out, put the new one in, off you go. That one's nice and simple. Here's the old one. Doesn't look like there's too much or anything at all wrong with it, but we're gonna change it out for this brand new Delphi unit. That way, bit of peace of mind, and we know we're back to square one again. So aside from the rings, bearings, and pistons and rods, everything else in the engine now is pretty much brand new. We've got timing chain, the tensioner, we've got the cam gears, we've got the oil pump, everything else is brand new in the engine. All the sensors are brand new, injectors, everything else around it bolted to the engine is brand new, water pump, all that sort of stuff. I do have a squeak from the idler pulley, so I'm probably gonna pull that apart or pull a spare one apart and rebuild it. And uh, otherwise, everything else is brand new now, so hopefully if we don't put too much boost in it, it's not gonna blow up. So I'll stick this in, 
on to the next job. Alrighty, they're all changed. Let's uh, test it out, see if we've got any engine lights or any codes. Will it start? Fired up beautifully. Now, over here on the Haltech, there's a little engine light symbol. Let's change screens. I like this dark look better. Um, it's not on. It's running and driving and idling and everything perfectly. This minus and plus for the intake cam, that's just because it's varying as it's uh, idling. So it's just warming up. So that's normal. Everything looks good. So that is a mission accomplished, mission success. All of those parts work exactly as they should. Why wouldn't they? They're brand new. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about though is I'm considering going to drive by wire on my car. A couple of reasons. I could if I wanted to have cruise control. I could if I wanted to have like a valet mode or anything like that where you couldn't punch the throttle all the way to full, full throttle. Both of those things are pretty crappy reasons. I'm not doing it for those reasons. The main reason would be for idling, uh, throttle control, possible traction control types of deals in the future uh, because I do have all the hub rings on all the corners so that I could run sensors for traction control so I could do all that through there. And I've got a Haltech Elite 1500 and uh, it has the feature and the option. The other reason is I want to get rid of this janky thing it's uh, annoying, it looks ugly, and there's a lot of room for error. Now I know there's gonna be old school people and I'm half on the fence with this about, oh yeah, but what if the electronics fail or something like that? That's not such a bad thing because if the electronics fail, the throttle has a spring in it, it'll just snap shut and it'll close. Uh, it's not gonna stick wide open, whereas this one could mechanically stick wide open and I could be stuck at full throttle. The Haltech has all kinds of engine protection and stuff all set up in there. So if it does over rev or just stays flat and whatever, it gets stuck wide open, it's gonna shut the whole car off anyway. So that is not really a concern. The benefits are gonna outweigh the negatives. At the moment, I've got nothing on here contro controlling the idle except for the good old fashioned screw down here, which is working. It's sitting at around about 950, which is pretty much perfect but that took me so long to dial in with an Allen key. It's in a really awkward spot. So I'm thinking just to go with a, you know, basic setup with a 74 mil or a 75 mil drive-by-wire throttle body, slam that on there, and then I'll put the pedal in under the dash. It'll get rid of that wire. It'll make things run nicely. The downside is there's extra wiring to do, but you guys know me, I'm not gonna be the one doing it. I'll get someone else who's a pro to wire that in and make it all neat and tuck all the wires away. So I think it's gonna clean up that front bit of the engine bay, make it idle better, run smoother. When it's cold, all that sort of stuff, I'll be able to just drive it. And at the moment, it won't be so jerky and all that sort of stuff. We can dial in how aggressive it is, how much delay is on there, all that sort of stuff. So I think it's gonna be really, really awesome. And then we can match all the other settings, we can match the VTEC to the throttle position. We can do all sorts of different things like that through the drive-by-wire throttle body. So I think, yeah, down the line, not right away because money and all that sort of stuff, but down the line, we'll get that done and we'll get the car tuned. At the moment, it's running and driving just fine. Uh, I might even put some bigger injectors in it and a bigger fuel pump. Evan from Unigroup said we're pretty much toward the top end, I think 80 or 90% uh, of the fuel injector, which is not where we want to be, uh, especially if we're only at eight or so PSI. Uh, I want to run that to about 10, and I want to make sure I've got plenty of fuel. We've got dash six lines all under the car, which should be plenty. And it's just, yeah, bigger injectors. Fuel pressure is all set schmicko, so that's good. And it's just, yeah, injectors, fuel pump, fuel change. Speaking of drive-by-wire throttle bodies, here's a couple of hacks for you guys playing at home. This one here is the factory K24 throttle body. Usually lives on there. Now this one is 60.6 mils in 
ID. It even says so right there. What I've done is gone and been wrecker hunting, dumpster diving, and I've grabbed myself a 64.6 millimeter throttle body. This is going straight onto Ronda and it would be an awesome upgrade to go onto my car, but I'm gonna get a much bigger one being that I'm turbo. And I also grabbed another one. There it is there, you can see 64.6 is what those numbers mean there. And I managed to sell that one to my good friend Chongy. He's gonna be putting that on a new customer's car and making all of the power. And luckily for us, we got this stage 1.5 Chong data tune, so we can literally slap this straight on Ronda. She'll run and drive fine and have even more power. So last time we got 31 hearse purrs. We're gonna slap this on, get a couple of extra hearse purrs. So probably looking at, you know, maybe closer to 40 horsepower gain out of Ronda. We are looking to do something else with the tires. We are looking to do something else with some aero and we've got better suspension set up now. So uh, we, the main reason for putting power into Ronda is just so that we don't have to absolutely beat on it to stick to that 135 time. We can now pretty much cruise and not hurt Rhonda, she can last forever and do all of the budget enduros. If we need to get away from someone, whop, wide open throttle, off we go, drop a gear, disappear, see you later. Here's a good hack for you guys playing at home. If you've got a CL9 or you've got a FN Civic, you can go grab yourself one of these, slap it straight on. These retail for about five or 600 bucks brand new. Or you can grab them at the wreckers for a good price, but there's guys around like me, Chongi, a few other people that are collecting these because they are an awesome, awesome upgrade. You don't want to go too big because that can affect your tune, leaning out, all that sort of stuff. And the way these plenums are designed on Hondas from the factory, certain amount of airflow, all of that sort of stuff, it's designed to run at a certain size throttle body. If you put too bigger on there without tuning it properly, you might hurt something, but um, Bigger is always better, and in this case, it's definitely gonna help out. And yeah, if you get it tuned, you can go as big as you want. A Chongi flash tune, one of these, and you are flying. So highly, highly recommend it. I'm gonna get into the next thing, which is suspension. We do this all the time. I'm not gonna bang on with how to, but I do wanna share some stuff with you. It's gonna really, really help, and probably maybe even change your mind about our good friends at Max Speeding Rods. Lucky for you guys, this video is a two-parter. I'm gonna do some suspension work to my Civic, which I've been meaning to do for a couple of months now. I'm not gonna take you through the process because I've done it to nauseam, so that means so much you're probably sick of it on my channel before but there is some very important news i've got to share with you about these coilovers and some things i've got to show you they're pretty easy to see with the naked eye and the differences will be incredible so first up in the car currently i have max peating rods in the front and i've got conies in the rear now i've got a full set of coney coilovers and i've got a full set of these blue max peating rods coilovers as well. We've got the front ones already fitted to the car. And the reason for pulling out the conies and adding in the max peating rods in the front only was the front wouldn't go high enough with the conies in there because, not that they weren't adjustable enough, it was because the extra weight of the K24 pushed them down so much under weight and under load that you couldn't adjust them up too much. You were just putting way too much preload in the spring, making the front end bouncy, and the sump clearance was pretty dangerous. If I hit a bump or smacked a pothole or something, it would have been the end of my case here. It would have ripped the sump clean off. So I needed to lift the front up. The way I could do that was by the help of Max Peating Rods, chucked in the coilovers, lifted the car up about 20 mil or an inch, and everything was cool. Since then, we've been at the racetrack with Ronda and we've been using these coilovers. These are the blue ones, these are the Series 6 coilovers. And I've actually gone and gotten some data on those coilovers. So these have been shock dynoed. And you can see here the line graph with a little bit of a interesting bump there. Now that is at 0, 5, 10, 15 and 25 clicks. Um, I think it's a typo because it's only 24. 
but you can see there all the lines, they're all pretty good until you go to full soft and then it doesn't want, really want to react very well. Over here, same deal on the uh, circle graph. Now basically what this is showing for those of you that don't know or aren't familiar, uh, your bound and rebound. So when the shock goes in and when the shock goes out. And you can see here that the graph, it's meant to be like a nice watermelon shape or an oval shape and we can see here that this end when it's um rebounding it's not very pretty it's all all over the shop and this is tested at every single click so yes they got pretty hot uh, which is probably one of the reasons that it fails so badly but here's the data what does that all mean well it means i've been talking to max peating rods to try and make their budget coilovers even better than they already are I have the luxury of working with a couple of suspension gurus and with their help, my research and development and just feeding that back to Max Peating Rods over in the factory in China, they have come back with a new Series 7 track spec and the way you can tell is it's got the grey springs and you can instantly see straight away they are slightly heavier. Here it says the numbers are 70.5. 12-180-7. These ones are 70.5 by 11 180 and 5. So these I believe are 5 kilo springs. These are 7 kilo springs. Now the main thing isn't the springs and isn't the harshness of the ride. It is what's inside here in the shock body. And the proof here is in the pudding. So this is the shock dyno from the CTO 7, which is the Series 7. You can see that is an exact mirror image on every single click all the way right through. It's exactly what you want. The perfect amount of up and down. Sure, this graph could be more reactive, straight up, straight across and down. But I think compared to this one, which is and then on this side, it's all right. And that side, it's not. This, you can see it goes up much higher down much lower and just works all around much better and if we take a look at the line graph again all the lines are nice and even and straight and consistent and you can see here at the beginning that it's starting to work right away so what i'm going to do is stick these in we're going to run these and just see how they go i'm sure they'll be perfect and i will be able to adjust the height up and down as much as i want so with the Coney's, I wanted it actually a bit lower in the rear and a bit higher in the front so that it sits nice and level, giving me that cool stance as well as being practical in and out driveways in the front. So I'm gonna switch those over now, slam it back down on the ground, show you what it looks like after it's done. But I thought you guys would like to know that. I may even have a play around with the spring rates and put the softer springs in the back because I don't want the back to skip around when I get to the racetrack. So I'll do a bit of back coilovers are in, nothing exciting. I've done the whole swap over. Down here we have the TCO6 shock bodies with the TCO7 uprated springs. We've got the front ones out now, and just those numbers here, 70.5 by 12-180-8. So that tells me that is a 12 kilo front spring. These new ones are 13 and a half. So it's 13.5-180-11. So quite a big jump. I'm gonna put the softer springs in purely just because I don't want a lot of axle tramp and wheel hop bouncing in the front. I'd rather be able to regulate that with a stronger shock. So that the shock's doing the work and the springs still give me a nice smooth ride. So I'll do a complete swap over and put these springs onto these shocks and these springs onto those shocks. There's a lot of extra work, but at least I know they'll all be fitted up perfectly all together and um, yeah, all sweet. One thing to note though, these guys have the pillow ball tops and these ones don't. Now for whatever reason, I don't know why that is. 
on the truck spec ones versus these, but you would think it would be the other way around. But anyway, I'll have a look once I pull them apart and see what I can do. And Alrighty, she's back down on the ground. Springs are all swapped over. All the sensors are good and uh, no lights on the dash. So uh, I'll call that a success. That's going to wrap up this video for today. Thanks so much for watching everyone. Don't forget to spool up, bring the boost, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Cheers.